and writer and filmmaker Sandra Luco, who will be in conversation with Ranjit Hoskote, poet and cultural theorist, and IWP alum himself. We will be exploring the way residencies offer the blend of communal living, peer review, and mentoring, and hear firsthand about how the program has impacted their practices. We also have special guest, Rochelle Potkar, another IWP alumni, here with us this evening. She will say a few words for us later on. Here's a little bit about our speakers. Sandra Alcoza's poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, and Paris Review. Awarded two individual artist fellowships from National Endowment for the Arts, her books of poetry, A Fish to Feed All Hunger, and Accept by Nature, received the highest honors from National Poetry Series, Academy of American Poets, and Associated Writing Programs. Her four artist book collaborations with Brighton Press reside in international museums and special collections. She was Montana's first poet laureate and recipient of the Merriam Award for Distinguished Contribution to Montana Literature. Sandra Luco, writer, director, producer, is an award-winning filmmaker who teaches film production at Yale University School of Art, Columbia, and Barnard Colleges. Her first documentary, Sharp Edges, won the Lewis Sudler Prize in the Performing and Creative Arts. It is aired worldwide and most recently seen in ESPN's 30 for 30, The Price of Gold. She received an MFA from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts in writing and directing for film and television. Her film, Belly Talkers, a cross-country road trip that explored the art of ventriloquism, premiered in competition at the Sundance Film Festival. Her current documentary, That Way Madness Lies, about her brother's paranoid schizophrenia, is in post-production and recently awarded a substantial financial grant from Artemis Rising. Ranjit Hoskote is a cultural theorist, curator, poet, and more recently a jury member of the Venice Biennale. He has authored more than 25 books, including such monographs as The Complicit Observer, Reflections on the Art of Sudhir Patwadhan. He has curated numerous exhibitions, including a mid-career survey of Atul Dodia, a Jahangir Sabawala retrospective, the 7th Guangzhou Biennale, and India's first ever national pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Rochelle Potker's book, The Arithmetic of Breasts and Other Stories, was shortlisted for the Digital Book of the Year Award 2014 by Publishing Next. Widely anthologized, a few of her poems and short stories have won awards, and she, is a writer in resident, she was a writer in residence at the UNESCO City of Literature, Iowa's International Writing Program, Fall 2015. Four Degrees of Separation is her first book of poetry and out on the shelves. She's working on a novel and two collections of short stories. And I'll pass it over to Ranjit and the panel. Thank you so much for those words of welcome and thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, I have to say this is a really special occasion for me because um, my time at the International Writing Program was really very, very special for me because um, it's one of those occasions that many of us who are writers dream of, to be at a little bit of a distance from the world that makes its claims and demands on you, a space of retreat where you can look at your practice, but also a, a community where you don't have to justify yourself or your practice or what you're doing with your time and your energy. And it's also a time of great intensity, I think. Any, any residency tends to be an occasion where you can work very intensely, you meet and you have encounters with people with whom you share perspectives, even if you don't share perspectives, there's, there are interesting collisions. And so for all of those reasons, among the various residencies I've been on, I think the IWP was very, very special. And I've also over the years, uh, this was a long time ago, it was 1995, but uh, over the years I've also had occasion to think about the program and how it's evolved and changed, how its beginnings lie in, frankly, the framework of the Cold War. It was one of, I mean, it was certainly allied to the kinds of cultural, the very interesting uh, soft power warfare, if you want to call it that, during the Cold War, where uh, the Soviet bloc on the one hand and the US were both putting out different kinds of cultural situations, opportunities to people in the non-aligned world. And I think many writers in the non-aligned world actually did very well out of this um, global scenario, uh, which is a cynical way of looking at it. On, on, on the positive, productive side, it meant a great 
widening of horizons, I think, for many, many people. And I remember the, the joy, the pleasure of being able to wake up and know that there was going to be a Louise Gluck reading or a Jerry Graham reading or Mark Doty. It was incredible that people who I idolized or read, who meant something to me in my practice as a poet, were people that I could hear and talk to and so on and so forth. So, so these are some of the thoughts that I've I kind of want to preface this discussion with, but what I really want to draw uh, to do is to really draw out both of our distinguished guests on this question of how a residency program can function as an incubator of creativity, but also whether the residency program is the only kind of situation or system that answers to this notion of an incubator. Uh, also, we I think it would be lovely if we could tease out the relevance or otherwise of a residency structure to the various arts, depending on what it is you might really want to do as a theater maker or a filmmaker or a dancer or a writer. So I'm wondering if I could begin by inviting both of you to, to think with us about the genealogy of the residency program. I mean, on the one hand, there's a venerable genealogy that takes it back to the monastery, the retreat, but there's another which goes back to the artist colony, Vops Vader, thinking of German experiments of the 19th century. So, Sandra, could I begin with you? I'm going to yes. say Sandra, and then I'm going to say Sandra again. <laughs> but this Sandra, Sandra on my left. <laughs> uh, could you maybe address this question of how a residency offers you the ability to, to work from your solitude, but also offers you this wonderful collegiality and collaboration? May I speak of MFA programs first, or Absolutely. we'll start there? Okay. I'm actually a professor in two um, universities. One is um, a, a traditional academic setting, and I'd like to talk just a moment about that. And then the other is what is called a low residency, and it's something relatively new in the United States. I know that MFA programs are new to probably most of the people here. Uh, so the first one is very much, uh, very closely nested within the English department, English and Comparative Literature. I founded this program when I came to San Diego. I didn't really plan to stay in San Diego. I'm not quite sure what happened, but it is a pleasant place to live, so I ended up staying there. And uh, I had come from a more formal background, and they just sort of gave me carte blanche to design this program. And from the very beginning, my dream was to have as much diversity as we possibly could. This was about 26 years ago, and people were talking about the MIC home, like McDonald's, uh, and they were accusing MFA programs of creating Mac poets. And that was the last thing that I wanted to do. And so our diversity goes, it's aesthetic diversity, uh, gender, racial, class, age, and so forth. So we have, uh, I think, the most vital community we possibly could have. And we have a number of international students as well. That is a three-year program. And the students come in at San Diego State. We have a journal which um, I'm going to give Rajit a, a, a list or a, um, Asad a, a list to share with you uh, so that you can go online and source all of these things. I was going to actually have a PowerPoint for you, but I had a little problem web surfing today. So. Um, Poetry, we have Poetry International and Fiction International, and I'd like you to go on, if you are interested, and take a look at those. We um, invite submissions from all over the world and print work from all over the world. When our students come in, they become interns for the journals, so they serve at least one semester as an intern um, reading, doing the blogs, interviewing other writers and so forth. And it's a very, very generative community. What we're trying to do, we sit at our desk, we spend so much time alone on so many beautiful days in our dark rooms, and there are many different things that we do to stimulate the conversation that is literature, 
that is poetry. So that's one type of, of conversation. It's a 54 unit program, so, and some of the uh, students from the Women's University were asking about this today. It's three years, but if we have some students who apply and they already have an MA, so then it's two years for them. And um, when they come out, most of them go into teaching at universities and community colleges and so forth and then they go on pursuing their their writing life the other one is a low residency program and many many writers in America are doing this now um, we meet uh, at first I said, a low residency, what is that? And then they asked me to join the core faculty at Pacific University, which is one of, uh, the, one of the top five low residency programs. And I saw the people I would be teaching with, and they were people I had thought of studying with. So I thought, well, this is, this is gonna be great. What's, what I like so much more about it, and I think writers do it for this reason, even though it, we make some money, but we're independent contractors, um, so we're carrying a double load, but the conversation is so rich. There, we come together for 10 days, and we each of us prepares a craft lecture, each of us oversees a, a workshop, and each of us does a reading. And it's very much, there was an experimental um, uh, college called Black Mountain College that we all kind of look back to, oh, if only we'd lived in the days of Black Mountain, where they had all of the arts coming together and inventing things on the spot. And that's what uh, low residency is like. The only thing that I can say if people are interested in this is you want to do your research, you want to go to one of the best, and they're somewhat expensive uh, because often it's professionals who are com professional doctors, lawyers, engineers, and so forth who don't want to take the time out or can't take the time out to go to a traditional academic community. So I'll stop there and I'll talk about residencies a little later, but that's the academic <laughs> side. Fabulous. No, thank you so much for that map. Uh, I just want to maybe draw you out a little more because it was it was very uh, inspiring the example of black mountain and the poetics that it mm -hmm. set going in so many different fields uh, a little sort of twinge of misgiving that i might have is uh, do you do you think there's a sort of uh, contradiction if you will between looking back to black mountain which was really a very very informal even eccentric arrangement mm -hmm. and the kind of professionalization that uh, you seem to be talking about in terms of the low residency program. I mean, there's a way in which academia is getting more and more and more professionalized. And Black Mountain was the very opposite of that. Right. So just. I think we have a sanctuary there. Okay. <laughs> I really do. And I think that the writers would flee in an instant um, if, if we didn't. But. I can't imagine, you know, my home is actually in Montana. I live in the mountains of Montana. And I can't, I, I, I always, I look forward to going back to Montana to hide. And then I look forward to the time when I come back to San Diego. And there I've been uh, fortunate to hire uh, a, a Russian poet named Ilya Kaminsky. He's actually from Odessa. He's quite famous. And he uh, was given political asylum in the United States at the age of uh, 15. He's been deaf since the age of four. He's, he, um, he edits Poetry International. And he also did an international uh, um, echo anthology of, of world poets. So I have Ilya there and we get together for all day, all night, till three in the morning poetry sessions. Then um, I was just able to hire Sherwin Batsui, who is someone radically different from the two of us. He just looks at us. Um, he is Navajo. He's Diné, and um, a very refined, very elegant um, man, and someone we love dearly. But I, I wanted to do that because I wanted to push that conversation out a little bit further because we were starting to draw heavily. We had students, a number of students coming from Eastern Europe into the program, and I thought, well, now let's widen this out a little bit more. <laughs> and we had Marilyn Chin before that. Well, let me take some of these thoughts to you, Sandra. Because <laughs> uh, I know you have a, a, a slightly different view of 
the residency, coming out of your work as a, as a filmmaker and your background in film? I wish, I wish that we had in filmmaking the type of residencies that Sandra is talking about. Um, my relationship with film education is incredibly complicated, contradictory, and, uh, and difficult uh, because First of all, one must one must realize that um, filmmaking, it, that directing a movie, which is really the second writer on a film, um, filmmaking the director is an entry level position. Traditionally, uh, it had been a mentorship within the studio system in the United States, um, and then with the advent and professionalization of film schools, it became really um, a business that is much akin to Nigerian internet scams um, in, in many ways where, you know, you give them a lot of money and they promise you um, very, you know, very big rewards and you're never really sure what they're doing in between. One of the reasons that I actually teach is a response to my own MFA experience um, at NYU Tisch School of the Arts, uh, where I really felt that, I mean, I went for all of the reasons that one would want to go to a film school to find like-minded people, to be able to um, collaborate and talk about story, to learn the technology, to have the ability to, because filmmaking is such a high stake um, and one that it can only be done in collaboration. You cannot make a movie by yourself. There's so many different working parts of it. So hoping to have that collaboration, um, what I ended up finding was that it was a professional money-making operation where the people that were there uh, teaching really wanted you to be there to reinvent the wheel. It was not about giving you the techniques in which to in which to be able to I mean film has been around for more than a hundred years there is a system of doing things that is not formula but rather technique and um, it's really about learning the tradition of the storytelling medium as opposed to the technology and uh, so I found it to be a, a, a very discouraging um, time and I really became very adamant that my life as a, an instructor, as a professional filmmaker, um, would be to exact my revenge upon this particular type of, um, of, the, of the education filmmaking model. Um, which I think is absolutely critical for, um, for young filmmakers um, and I mean that in sort of, I mean that, I don't mean young as in age-wise, I mean sort of in the embryonic creative state. Um, because, it, you know, I, I have to tell you a little story that I was, that I was um, telling you earlier, is that we had a life-changing experience here in India. When we were in Chennai, we got to go on a turtle walk. And we went to, we went to the, and it was such a metaphor for me of, um, of what it means to be an emerging artist. And so, you know, it is, it is the job of those that came before, or even of another species, to, to be able to guard and protect these, these, these embryonic, you know, these eggs, essentially, that are underground. These little turtles come forth, they're, you know, they're this big, and they have to make their way towards the sea in order to, and then, and as they're making, you can't just drop them in the sea and wish them good luck. You have to, you have to let them imprint on the sand so that they know where their home is. They know where to come back and be able to give back. And so, you know, so we watched these little turtles, you know, going to the sea with the full knowledge that they were entering into this vast ocean of which there were many, many sharks and, and other animals that wanted to, wanted to eat them, in other words, film schools, um, and, uh, you know, or the industry itself. And then, you know, and w w they told us the statistics were that 
one in 1,000 of these little turtles would actually be able to come back and reproduce themselves. And it was, it was you know, I felt, I felt like if this is how I can think of my role as mentor, as guardian of somebody else's creativity, that is the way that films, that is the way that uh, film school should be run in the sense that we can, we can guide, we can uh, nurture, we can foster, we can protect to a certain degree. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I'm sort of lost my train of thought there, but, but um, you know, I, I, it's, it's real, it's it, because show business is a business business being the larger word of those two. Um, I, think that, I think that a lot of the commerce gets in the way of the actual creativity and you don't have a chance in many ways other than film school to practice your craft. And, you know, when do you get a, ch I mean, a, you know, you are directing a movie, a high, you know, if you're directing a movie, you're directing a movie. You can't really go out and practice directing a movie. And so to be able to, you know, create an environment of like-minded people, the problem with residencies of filmmakers in the, in the US is that they won't take beginners. They take people that are already of a professional level. And, and that's truly problematic. It's one of the reasons that I started the, um, uh, it's, it's really a boot camp is what it is, um, a filmmaking um, workshop um, at Yale University that literally is five weeks where we meet three times a day. Um, so from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock, from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock, from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, for six weeks, four days a week, they see, they see 13 short films, they see 25 feature films, and they make their own films. And really that sort of immersive type of situation, I'm trying to get three years of film school into six weeks, you know, of what they're learning. So that's where I'll stop. Fortunately, um, poetry doesn't have that problem with commerce. <laughs> and I envy that. A, a, a best-selling book of poetry would be uh, 40,000 copies. Wow. So we're able to stay pure. <laughs> Are you was my next question, actually. But, I mean, not in terms of commerce, but... Uh, there's the trope of the sanctuary, which came up, I and mean, you introduced it uh, with your story about the Olive Ridley turtles. That comes into play even more strongly. Uh, my question would be, how do you secure these sort of temporary liberated zones, the, the immersive workshop for you, the low intensity program? How do you, how do you, you know, retain, I mean, you use the term purity. I mean, purity as something against commerce is one way of doing it, but how do you establish a certain kind of distance from the academic structure and what it demands? Uh, well, I was going to say something about, uh, about the IWP as a footnote, but I've seen that over the years it's gone from being a place where writers could simply do their own thing, really. If they didn't want to see a soul, they didn't have to see a soul, they could just do their writing, to a stronger degree of engagement with with the comparative literature department to now a point, I believe, if Rochelle, you'll tell us more later, where essentially you spend a lot of your time doing lectures and talks and meeting with the community. So that, to my mind, is another form of, you know, if you will, loss of purity of purpose. But could you, could I ask you to speak to this? I think that's always the writer's problem: is balance and time. It's, it never gets better. I tell young students, you have to learn as much as you can. This is something you have to come close to mastering. You, to have a full life, to have food, to have a shelter, to have a family, if, if that's your wish. How do you put all of those things together and still find the time to write? And so may I jump to the other type of residency? I was often awarded um, residencies. They'd appear, get invited someplace, and 
I, I'm a little shy, so I wasn't sure how I was going to like something like this. So the way that I've made my way in the world as a writer has been as a worker. I enjoy coming and doing something like this because I meet so many interesting people. Um, and then I can go back to my, my room. And I didn't know what these other places would be. Um, I agreed to go to Breadloaf. Mm -hmm. An invitation came out of the blue. I would hear all the legends about bread loaf and all the things that happened there, and I didn't know if I was going to like that. So the first time I went, I was very suspicious. It's like, someone spoke to me. He's like, what do you want from me? But I, what I learned was I made friends, and as, as their books came out, I really could celebrate with them. And so I had, that was my first time in an away community. But I continued, for instance, I uh, did an international, I taught an international writing program in, at the National University of Ireland in Galway, did workshops all over, served as writer in residence for a semester at a time in places like University of Michigan and so forth. I liked that. I liked that I could be in a working situation and then could retreat. But this, probably three years ago, Chris Merrill, who was responsible for IWP, he, I came here because Chris invited me to do it. And I was actually, he's back at AWP right now, the huge conference with 14,000 people will be descending on Los Angeles this very night, um, writers. He had to go back because he's an officer there. But when I got the invitation, I was supposed to do all of these things at, at AWP, and I pulled out and I said, I have never done anything with Chris that did anything but change my life. I did something called the Forgotten Language Tour, which was a nature tour, and it was the first time I missed my teaching classes to go on something. That changed my life. And then a few years ago, I got um, in, in the mail something that said, congratulations, you have been invited to the Hermitage in Florida. And I thought, why in the world would I want to go to this house on a beach in Florida. I have a perfectly fine house on the beach in California, and I'll just waste my time. Dinner, you have to have dinner with people, and I don't know, it just, it just didn't sound like a good sol retreat, solitary place to go and write. I got there, oh, the first year I canceled, so you got six weeks. And um, you could spread it over two years. The first year I canceled, I said the plane, the plane fares were going up, and I just didn't go. The second year, I said to my friends, and my friends all say, oh, you should go. But then my parents always used to push me off the porch and say, go make, make friends. So, so um, I, I got there, and it was, there were five five of us there in three different buildings. So I had what was called the pump house. It was a, a house unto itself. It was actually the composer's house, the musician's house. And then I was the only woman and there was, there were, there was a playwright and two visual artists. I noticed that they worked all the time. And I had been a writer since I was probably 20 years old, and I didn't know that. Because I grew up in a pragmatic background where you had to do your work, your physical labor, you had to do your chores, and so forth, and take care of everyone and make sure that everyone was fed, and then you could go have your time to make your art. Or you had to go teach your class, or you had to do something. So I started watching them, and it really fascinated. You mean you sit in your room all day and night sketching or making art? And they would stay up, and we had like a little porthole, and they would stay up until at least 3 o'clock every morning. And I was like, oh, well. If those guys can stay up till 3 o'clock every morning making their art, I can stay up till 3 o'clock every morning making my art. And I settled into that rhythm, and it 
I mean, this was just a couple of years ago. It has radically changed my life, so much so that my husband says, oh, Sandra, she never goes anywhere. She just sits at her desk all day. But I love it. And so that, and out of that came um, a collaboration that I'm doing with uh, Michael Ede, who is a visual artist in New York, exquisite, exquisite artist. We performed it at uh, Symphony Space. I wrote a sonnet sequence for the Trinidad Symphony because of that. Um, various collaborations and so it was really generative in that way and I could carry it with me plus I, I actually learned how to be a full-time living poet at a very very late age. <laughs> I'm wondering if I could take those motifs of practice and collaboration to, to your own work Sandra. Yeah. Because something um, that you said a little earlier about these immersives suggests that it's the kind of place where you could have these unpredictable encounters which lead to the kind of collaborations that uh, that the other Sandra was talking about. <laughs> Absolutely, and I and I actually I think it also speaks to your first question um, about remaining pure. Um, I never thought that I would be on a stage in India talking about my purity, but um, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, first of all, one of the ways to remain pure is an artist in academia, which is, is that I have the great fortune of working for the Yale School of Art, the professional school, even though I teach undergraduates. And they deny me tenure be, and to become a full academic so that I will be a practicing artist. You cannot be full time at the university so that you can remain in the field, up to date, and and as an academic, as uh, would it be expected to publish, you know, I am expected to produce um, outside of the academic setting, and I think that that actually is very useful. Um, to my students and to my own well-being in terms of I don't immerse myself in the politics of, um, of academia and it's really about the work. Um, and that's and that's also a really interesting, you know, sort of in terms of my own personal um, professional work is it being about the work. And it's not, per I mean, it's uh, when you have to be in collaboration with people, I think the biggest job of the filmmaker is to bring other people into your world that you're trying to create, into your vision. Um, if I were, if I, well, I do give advice to young filmmakers. I was going to say, if I were to give advice to young filmmakers, but I do do that, um, I would, the first thing that I would say, regardless of what kind of films you want to make, I would say, you know, we have the resources now with digital technology to go out into the world and see what works. See what you can capture in real life. Um, I am primarily a documentary filmmaker because I find real life so much more interesting than fiction. Um, you can't make it up, but you certainly can write it down. And so I really feel like to understand the contradictions, the complexities of the world around you and how that looks good on film, and then be able to take and steal from the real life and make those then the fictional world that you're trying to create, it, is, it ends up being so much richer, so much more complex, and it draws people into it. Um, I also had a very amazing education from my parents. My mother um, had the most vivid imagination you could possibly imagine. And she spent 25 years of her life building a 1 12th scale dollhouse. In this dollhouse, which was bigger than she was, but in this dollhouse lived an amazing imaginary world that of characters that she drew from her childhood in Mexico City. Uh, there, was, there was the drunken butler. There was the gardener who was having an affair with the nanny. There was the 
master of the house who was also an inventor and lost his great invention of electricity to Thomas Edison. Uh, and she was so able to create such a full and complex and a little weird world that other people wanted to be a part of it. And I thought this, more than anything else, is my education in filmmaking. Because first of all, it's so visual. But she literally had a wedding for her dolls. She had a wedding between the gardener and the, and the nanny. Unfortunately, the nanny was pregnant at the time of the wedding, which was why the people of the house had to hold the wedding, because it didn't look good for the neighbors. Um, and she made these little tiny invitations that were so small, I mean appropriate to the size of the dolls, but so small that she sent them to real people with a magnifying glass. These people were then invited to the wedding. They were assigned a doll. So her casting was brilliant because a lot of the people looked like the dolls that were representing them. She then, she then held a wedding and, during, and then during the reception had miniature food in which to feed the people little tiny champagne glasses of which, you know, you had about seven glasses of champagne and you were feeling pretty good. Um, and then during the reception, the baby was born. <laughs> and the idea, we, you know, fortunately I filmed, I made a movie about her doing this very thing. And I, you know, I show it, I show it to students, I show it to, uh, I've shown it around at a lot of festivals and um, when people hear about the movie, they think, okay, I really want to see this crazy woman. When people see the movie, they come away with a great deal of envy for the passion and wishing that they too had something that they could so clearly be immersed in. And so I think that when it becomes about the work, when it becomes about creating and you know, and that, ha and I, and I think that the only way to be able to learn that is through mentorship, is really through find somebody that you admire, find somebody whose passion is delightful in a way that you can say, I want to be like that person. I don't listen. My mother and I were so completely on the opposite ends of the political uh, spectrum. We couldn't talk about who we were going to vote for. But, you know, what, she, what I have in common with her, which I hope that I inherited from her, is that idea that I can also draw, particularly in a profession where I have to collaborate, draw people in. And I have had such luck in my career of having wonderful teachers, wonderful mentors, people that were as invested in my success as they as they were in their own success, that it was what you were talking about with um, the idea that somebody could publish a book and it's not about the competition. It's about the joy that somehow, because of your relationship with that person, you are a part of it. And you are a part of that success. And that them simply knowing you is part of the reason they were able to do that book. You know, and I think that I think that you know, it, it, the, for years and years in the Holly, you know, the Hollywood studio system, as much as it is maligned, um, was such a great mentorship, apprenticeship, learning ground, because you know you were working on 50, 60 films a year, in whatever capacity. Um, that doesn't exist anymore, and so you know, to attach yourself to somebody that you admire, and listen, people love to be admired. You know, and so really the idea of going up to somebody who you idolize and saying, I want to follow you around is... is That's kind of creepy. <laughs> in a professional sense. <laughs> yeah, I guess that didn't sound so good. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Okay. Well, you know, I told you I had two stalkers. That's why I'm really oh, to that. <laughs> 
Okay, let's retrieve the high ground. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's the purity thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, gosh, yeah. No, uh, let me just take forward some of this, because it's a really rich and productive discussion. I want to try and uh, take these thoughts to you now, Sandra, because the kind of uh, context that you've sketched out, uh, you've, you know, being out there in, in a production system as an apprentice, working, I mean, sort of learning as it were on the job, that's sort of being out in the arena. But many residency programs, especially for writers, I'm thinking here, tend to be more like cocoons. So I don't know if you want to talk about this, you know, fairly sharp difference, I think, how it works for writers and how it works for people I, in film. I'm not sure that I understand the question, but out of those cocoons emerge beautiful butterflies. I want to tell you um, about uh, an Indian poet who is our student right now. His name is Hari Aluri, A-L-L-U-R-I. He has two books coming out while he is in the program. Uh, one from um, Kaya, it's a um, oh, Pan-Asian uh, press in the United States, and I can't remember the other, the other press. But uh, he's editing for Poetry International. He's he's just having a, a wonderful time doing all sorts of things, and um, we negotiate for those students like crazy. Not only we worry so much about them when they're they're in their final year and what are they going to do and and sometimes we help them a little bit too much and they, <laughs> there was one Latino student who uh, uh, he was just extraordinary extraordinary human being and and I would bring him something about a competition or something and and um, he he he's an elect electrician or repairs repairs things and I, I was thinking, well, you, we kept having this discussion. I wanted, and I was tentative and respectful, but I, I worried. You know, was he going to be able to support him? He was getting married. Was he going to be able to support a family and still be a poet? I didn't want him to lose that. And I also thought he would be a remarkable um, professor. And that's one of the things right now with historically underrepresented um, students, we have a particular advantage, and we really work that advantage to to get jobs for them. And so that's where I was going with Jesus. So we're having this discussion probably for about the fifth time in the last year, and um, I said, "And you're getting married. Um, what uh, what does your wife do?" And he said. She's a professor. <laughs> oh, all right. I'll leave you alone, Jesus. I know you have. You've come up with it with a solution, um, but I, I'm not quite sure. You, can you make it a more pointed? I just wanted to tell them about Hari, because I want them to know that, to keep their eye out for this <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal Indian poet. And I have to say, when he came in, his probably his biggest weakness is that he wrote too much. And he wasn't paying enough attention. And we worked with him, worked with him, worked. And he, he, he would go back and just, he, he, could, he would just take it in. He was just able to take in whatever we said and go back and rework those poems. So they're really exquisite, exquisite now. And not McPoems. <laughs> no, it, was, it wasn't a question. It was a prompt, and you answered it. So there we are. Mm. But I thought this might, sorry, Sandra. Well, I was just, if I could speak just to a second to the idea of, of the cocooning, um, which I totally agree that a cocoon does produce a beautiful butterfly. Um, but I think that it, what it really comes down to, whether you do it with other distractions, and you were talking about the balance in the family, um, or if you have the opportunity to really just solely concentrate, it ultimately comes down that it must be full and total commitment. Commitment, whether it's going to be at a retreat and uh, at a place where you can have the moment to shut out the rest of the world and commit yourself, or whether you are going to commit yourself with all of the distractions of daily life, you simply cannot do it halfway. And I think that that's the real common um, thread that, that we have in terms of talking about it. Once Sandra got that 
commitment of 24 seven, you know, it changed her life. Once, so she stopped playing at being a poet when all, uh, you know, uh, only when all the other work was done and it became the priority. And that's a very scary, um, tenuous thing to do, but it has to be without any hesitation or reservation. The funny thing is I'm at a point where I could easily retire right now and I, I think about it and I think what do I do without the conversation? Mm -hmm. And it's the conversation of, of all literature and it's the conversation with these wonderful, wonderful poets and I don't know that I would have that living in my cabin up in the mountains mm -hmm. surrounded by, by uh, foresters. But the other thing I want to say, we're talking about product and as I always say it's more process when it comes to poetry than product. I mean yes you can publish as many books as you'd like and as many poems and we do that and that's 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 part of our life. But I cannot imagine a richer life than I've had and um, someone just asked me for a book that's coming out, I did an essay for Kwame Dawes, and um, we were to put a, another writer's quote there, and mine was uh, from Theodore Retke, um, I learned by going where I have to go, and poetry has taken me so many enriching places. I've worked for the last, um, since 2004, um, with scientists, helping them articulate what it is they have to share about the dangers of this planet. And so uh, I moved back to New York to do that. And so I was at that point living in uh, Montana, San Diego, Portland, which is where Pacific University, the low residency is, and then also teaching in Ireland and then added to that uh, living six months of the year in New York, which was pretty wild. But this is what an academic life has afforded me. I basically teach one graduate course a year. The rest of the time I take, I direct a program and then I take leave in spring semester and I get research leave to, to be away and, and create my work. But that was after giving Donating blood <laughs> at the MFA bank. <laughs> They're very good to me. Um, but this work with the scientists, it's not only my poetry. When they invited me to come to New York, they didn't know what they wanted. And they wanted me to write, the, to, to, to take in their work, to read their essays, to... to um, ingest their, 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 their message and somehow create poetry for that. And I said, no, 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 that's not, that's not what you want to do. First of all, I write in geologic time. You would wait a very long time for that poetry that you want to put up in these installations. Second of all, the poetry is read that we put up, and Mark Doty is part of it, W.S. Merwin's part of it, Jane Hirschfield, on and on and on. Um, that poetry is read by 150 million people a year in America, we're in six cities now, they're from all over the world. So I said, here's what I want to do. One, I want to make this a celebration of being on this earth and being alive and the life that we're surrounded by that is not only human life. That was the first, to me, that was the first priority. The second thing I wanted to do was show our engagement across with, with tribes and species for as far back as I could go. For me, poetry is a 4,000 year wisdom tradition that I am fortunate in this brief I hope 100 years of my life, um, I will be able to, I'm able to be part of. It's all process. It's deeply spiritual. The currency is not what we would aut automatically think of as one that you can take to the market to buy food. So I have these pragmatic things I do to be able to, to buy food. But they're all, they all have a certain passion, passionate engagement.
So I think it's, to me, it's, it is that constellation that is living. Uh, very, very inspiring thoughts, especially as we all grapple with the consequences of the Anthropocene. So with that, I'm going to actually now ask Rochelle Potker to join us and uh, speak from your experience of the residency. Uh, I think that's working. It's on, actually. And then we can involve everyone here in uh, questions. And Good evening, everyone. So, um, so observing all the, this wonderful conversation that we were having, and I like it when, when the points are in yin and yang, because that makes it come full circle. So I was just thinking about, I think, Sandra, that I'm the turtle, because, uh, because for me, the experience has been life-changing. And this has been just one residency that I've gone to. And um, I really th I liked that uh, imagery of the turtle being led into the Chennai waves. Because and you survived it. <laughs> oh yes, and I'm 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 still thinking about it. <laughs> okay, and I also am observing that the that the narrative of residency experiences uh, seem to be changing as we go along the timeline. So from uh, uh, many years and from a recent experience, which is just four months, I've just been to Iowa four months ago. So um, I'm not sure uh, how I would look look at this uh, experience twenty years later, but. Um, I think it would still be life-changing for me. And um, uh, the narrative, my uh, sharing of this would also come from the narrative of deficits. Um, not only from the states of traffic jam and pollution and congestion and queues, uh, but also from the fact that our country has less residencies or almost no residencies and not many grants, funds, prizes, contests. So m my uh, narrative is from the deficit to the surplus. So uh, it probably is, you know, quite uh, skewed, if I may say so. Um, Iowa was the only fairy tale that happened to this writer's life, where every other thing besides inspiration and ideas has been a bit of a work. A few years earlier, I had done a virtual advanced fiction seminar from Iowa with 14 other selected writers from across the world, and had then applied to the Sangam House residency which rejected my application saying, nothing wrong with your content, but we are oversubscribed. By then I had learned I hated queues, I hate templates in any case, and thought of buying a house in Goa with two extra rooms for writer friends and having a self-residency of sorts. You know the thing about queues is that your life might come to pass, but trends and subjectivity will always rule the day. All right, so I didn't go after Iowa. Iowa was brought to me by a script larger than the one I was writing. You can call it fate, destiny, serendipity, luck, hard work, or just a matter of fact checklist that needs checking. When I get a call from the American library that I wasn't even aware existed in BKC to send me 15 pages of writing sample, and expect nothing in return. This was one of those routine applications that have to go every year, and I thought, you don't have to tell a writer or an artist not to expect. We never do in any case. I selected my best poetry, haibun, short story, and sent it to the American Library, discovering accidentally this place of plush silence, holding thousands of books, and meeting Parvati, Sita, Tejaswini, Shushma, Simran, with Brittany Stewart and Anamika Chakravarti um, at the helm, who envisage newer and newer interesting programs of intellectual engagement. This team chose my application from Mumbai, and then, as prescribed, I forgot all about it. The first thing I noticed about Iowa was its sprawling green, blue, and gold cornfields. Somebody whispered, Quaker Oats. For a Mumbaiker, that is a treat. The driver who came to ferry us from airport and later to the grocery shoppings was, of course, a poet. Jason, who vacuum cleaned my room, was, of course, a writer and poet in an undergrad program. The lady at the reception who lent me a plastic bag for my laundry was, of course, she knew her Chaucer from her Peswa. Even the Iowan squirrels were busier than its students, and my farewell presentation was on the industriousness of that squirrel and how it should be the mascot of IWP. Yeah, it was always ahead of me at every museum and library. 
The second thing I noticed that there was a, there were a diverse range of 33 writers, filmmakers, and poets altogether, 34, from different ages and stages. Someone had just been sh long listed for the Guardian Prize. Someone was beginning to write fiction at 60 after an award-winning essay, a career as an essayist. And a young bloke who didn't know what a screenplay was had just won a prize for it. In this large bunch of electrifying people, not one of them was insecure. No stamped toes, no invisible shoves. And having taken competitiveness for granted, I was just waiting for something to show up. But week after week, what instead showed up was the greatest camaraderie, sharing, and humanity I had ever seen or been part of in a group. Nobody trading fake praise for approvals or for five minutes of reading time. Had I died and reached heaven, I thought. With this cherishing group, the green room was on the stage, the backstage and gallery was one. I even had a Nigerian writer tell me on the third day of the residency that he always wanted to fall in love with a beautiful Indian girl, eh? <laughs> to which I said, that you might be the 419s of your country. I'm the 420s of mine. Very slowly, you knew why L. Jones ran into the mornings every day, no matter rain, heat, or fatigue. A spoken word poet laureate from Halifax, she ran against the unbearable veneers of racism in her country, the history of slavery and its invisible, silent inheritance until today. Margarita at 65, who was first on any dance floor after smoking her Cuban cigar. <laughs> Or Yu Pai, who was a fire brigader from humble settings when not reading poetry before On San Suu Kyi, whom he called Burma Superman. The other thing was how English was brutally assaulted, and I liked seeing its frayed fragmentation. 28 of us did not speak English and needed a huge translation nexus to filter in that English. By then, we had Australian, Pakistani, Indian, Irish, Canadian, and Sri Lankan English, but also began by being basically human because we couldn't use our well-crafted phrases on each other. What shone through was our persons from our personas in the muteness of language, ironically being writers and poets. What we came to rely on was the essence that language residues when it leaves us, as we referred to each other as the girl from India, Burma boy, Pakistani brother, Afghani girl, because we even did away with our complicated names and last names. And as we shared pizza and dancing, I made the Mexican shake to Chikni Chameli, show them what we've got, and then the Brazilian pants and says, this is too fast. We shared the stories of ourselves, our countries, in informal readings in the common room of the Iowa House Hotel, and then formally at Shambo House, at the Prairie Lights Bookstore, at Poetry Foundation, and the Library of Congress, Washington. We dwelled over what feminism meant from Australia to Singapore to India, Taiwan, Canada, and Austria and knew how spoken word poetry could be fueled by rage and rhythm, while page poetry might just be the abstract lilt, a cooler battle with the same disdain. How to always keep our inner majnoon alive is what our Uzbeki friend, Ghazal Begim, spoke of. What happened here was a larger than page reviews of our lives as people, writers, poets, but mostly as wanderers, siblings of similar wilderness sometimes caught in jungle fires like Raid al-Jishi, who witnesses the execution of poets in Saudi Arabia, sometimes with bushfire burns like Birgul Oguz, who sees civil unrest in Turkey, and sometimes like Homera Kaduri, who witnesses every woman lashed and punished on the streets of Afghanistan. The third thing that happened didn't even occur to me when it happened, in, but four months later, one dark afternoon when I was sitting in the St. Xavier's College um, discussing the syllabi as, a, as an industry expert, and the principal walks in, and uh, he says, raise the bar. And I thought, that's exactly what happened in Iowa. The people behind the scene, the visionaries of this whole program, from the ardent and breathtaking Christopher Merrill to Natasha, the speaker of nine languages, to poets Kathleen and Hugh, to sitting with us here, Kelly, in their conversions had raised the bar to make this a place of great thirst, learning, inclusiveness, and enterprise. 
And what I said at the US Consulate of Washington, if all screamed at a tree with hatred and spite, it could be felled without an ax. So the corollary must be equally true. If all sang a song of praise, of prayer, we could grow lush forests. I think stakeholder agenda, being in alignment with your success and well-being, is the crucial element of generosity. After Iowa, I have come back to the I, because if I take the I away from Iowa, the story is over. For you, I bring a two-bit essence. The first being your limitation is your imagination. The second, that the outer limits is delusion, yours and the world's. Within these parentheses of dream and delusion, you can do anything and everything you want to do. For me personally, now that I have approval from the highest place, I can continue with making all the mistakes I had always wanted to in structure, style, and form. Speaking of residencies, I've applied for a grant to host a two-week Mumbai-based residency uh, that I call the Seven Islands Residency to welcome writers and poets from 10 South Asian countries to dialogue and converse over gender-based violence. If this comes true, and fingers crossed, I hope to seek your participation in this course. Keep on keeping on, said Peter Nazareth on the eve of my departure from Iowa. And to keep faith in the foliage, I will end this note by embodying my experience in a few prose poetry lines. Walking over the drawbridge over the Iowan River, I see boats of UI students in yellow and black uniform rowing on, leaves curling at my feet onto the other side to the art library where books of poetry and painting are waiting, books that smell of ancientness and then to the theater building that shows plays for five dollars. The UI center for the book where Tom is teaching paper making in the Arabic style and three of us extra students barge in to mix starch with water, draining out a coarse rough page embedded with seeds. So you must, must throw this paper after use inappropriately anywhere but in the dustbin. So it degrades and as it does, sprouts the seeds, bursting thoughts of the mind, ink on starch that will grow a tree someday of a full-grown ideology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasha. And this might be the moment for questions that I'm sure you have for our speakers today. Hi, my question is to Sandra. Which one? Uh, which which two? <laughs> the poetry one. I wanted to ask, uh, what is the difference between a poem and a song? How far is the difference? And why can't a poet, poet, writer, poet, 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 poet be a songwriter? I mean, you know, he can make a living out of being a songwriter. So how far is a poet from a songwriter? There really isn't a great difference. Um, th perhaps the audience might be different. But for instance, if you take uh, a sonnet, that's a little song. So there's, they're, they're very, very close. Um, I, I wasn't aware of that. I think early on we kind of make the distinction that, oh, well, that's, those are lyrics and this is a poem. But there's lyric poetry and there, poetry comes from song. So I, I don't see the distinction, really. The metrics, you know, it's, it's scored on the page the way that music is scored. So there's just many, many um, equations between those two. For example, in Hindi, we have, in Urdu, we have Gazette yes. songs. So uh, what, how would you equate a Ghazal in English? What is, what is a Ghazal in English? Is it a poem? No, I don't think so. Yes, absolutely. It is? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Do you know Aga Shahid Ali's work? He created a hustle revolution in America and uh, had, has a book of American poets writing hustles um, called Radiant Disunities. I have to say, and I'm sure Chris Merrill, if he were here, wouldn't agree with me, but I don't really feel that we do all that well with hustles. <laughs> There's some, nor do 
most of us do that well with haiku. There's, there's a different sensibility. If I may, Ranjit. Ranjit. Do you know the one? No. Uh, Ajaz Ahmed with Mark Strand and uh, oh, W.S. Yes, Moen yes, and yes, Adrian yes, Rich. Yeah. Okay, okay, hang on. We have to restore law and order. What you were, you were before haikus, that. Talking about haikus, do we have anything like that in Hindi that you have seen? Uh, you know what? Um, I think there's some sort of system about one person, one vote. So like that, one person, one question. And we'll I, I, uh, a brief annotation to that, and then there are two other people who very, are waiting. Ranjit, very quickly. I think she was trying to draw the difference, essentially, between a poet, a per se, and one who is called a lyricist or a songwriter relating to the movies, etc., mm -hmm. professionally. Yes, yes, yes. There is a kind of distinction there. Yes. That's all I wanted to append to that. My name is Anant, and I'm not a poet, not a writer, on the technical side, business side. Can you hear me well? No. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes. yes. Much okay. Better. So I like the idea of this residency. Sometimes I would do it, but uh, uh, I'm in kindergarten, maybe. But could you talk about how do you measure your success and frustration? And f I won't say failure, but when do you know the six weeks or the six months? When do you know? Okay, I've done enough for tonight to three in the morning or four in the morning. In 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 engineering or computer science or business, you know, my professor gave me an F. I know I failed, you know, uh, or they'll not give me a degree, and I know I'm flunked. But how, when do you know to stop? When do you know to restart? When do you know to roll back or go forward? I teach a workshop on revision, and what I like to show them is how radically different poets are when it comes to revising. Uh, Donald Hall will do hundreds and hundreds of revisions, and then the, the, of course the beats, you know, first word, best best word, and 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 so forth. Um, but I I believe that that that, uh, that statement a poem is never finished just abandoned and I've given myself a lot more permission of late to go in and just tear just as though it were an engine tear a poem apart and go back even after it's published numerous times rewrite that poem so to me it's a kind of play and we're playing with language and maybe it doesn't sound quite right and I don't always know for instance, sometimes when I read it, it won't sound quite right, or sometimes on the page, I'll look at it, doesn't sound, doesn't look quite right. But um, the thing that works best for me is to write uh, a series of things and put them away for six years. But then that, that I have to get a better process, and I'm really working on sending it out, putting it in the world, and then looking at it. But I think that's that's your decision. And the main thing about MFA programs, I have to say, or about any writing instruction, and this is for all of you, if the person tells you what is right and what is wrong, run. <laughs> <laughs> Be very, very careful. When I respond to a poem, I always ask a question. I don't turn it into an imperative voice command because there is poetic license. There is no definitive way. I don't know. I can't recognize every genius. I can only say to them from a subjective point of view, have you considered this? And hope. Now, sometimes when we're getting close to publication of someone's book or the end of their three years and they still don't have it, I'll speed up the process. And they can't believe the transformation that takes place. And, what? I thought I knew her. <laughs> so I've, I'm able to do it, but I prefer to stand as far back as I can to let them come forward. I think you also have to adapt your definition of success and failure. And when you say that. Thomas Edison, um, the inventor, said, I have not failed. I have found 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> but but it's a, what you are doing is a moment in time. Right? It's not a differential equation. It is not a financial statement. Keep on going back over it and revise. It's a moment in time. You did it. So how do you know that? OK, good. I try it on other people. Uh, <laughs> I do. And I trust them. Um, I, let me just tell you something that uh, uh, poetry salons. I've been part 
of several, and I've learned, I actually learned to be a much better teacher. I was part of a very famous one called the Rattlesnake Ladies Salon, and it's in the Rattlesnake Valley in Montana. And these were all professors and professional writers. And I would put something out there, I'd get 10 radically different opinions, and I was young enough in what I was doing that I would just put it in a folder and never look at it. Somehow it got killed. Do you know, it just got killed. Then we started a break-off group called Wildcat Road. And Wildcat Road was another group of women, but very quiet women, and we were down to five. But, and it, it worked because I could listen very closely to their silences and see if I got what I wanted. Um, and then I could change it, I could tune that poem accordingly. But the problem is there are a lot of hy hypochondriacal women in that group and after a while everyone was talking about their aches and pains and not about poetry so I, I then decided okay I'm going to meet one-on-one. -on -one. I have um, a wonderful poet friend Shadab Zist Hashmi uh, who is um, Pakistani-American and she's really good at zeroing in on the image. My dear, dear brother poet Ilya Kaminsky, whom I adore, if the poem is going this way, when Ilya finishes, it's going that way. I know that he'll do that. And then I meet with another Irish poet in Montana, and, my go and she gives great permission, but my goal for her is to make her cry. Because the Irish love to cry, and I love to write a poem that makes her cry. So I, I and, and I prefer that rather than meeting with a group of people, but to have these finely, finely tuned people who, who, who can read and respond back, and it continues the conversation. So the conversation isn't just with yourself in your room. So, so not hogging, but quickly. Uh, it's been two decades since I heard the word dene. And next time you want a house sitter for your Montana place, I'm very happy to Great. babysit it for you. Really? Well, I should take your name and, and phone number. Or, or no, or email. <laughs> Madam, the full form of poem is people of emotional maturity. Poem is like a dome. A poet is like a duet. Poet, is, poet full form is people of emotional totality. She has the difference between writer and poet. Poet is on a duet and a writer of fiction creates friction with a lot of diction. <laughs> madam, see, one more, one more line I want to say. Yeah, my question is, Madam, uh, Madam Sandra, Madam, what do you watch in a film? Means, when you are, you showed 13 short films and 25 feature films. But you never told us, what do you watch in the film and, and how to understand what to watch in that film? Thank you. What do I watch in a film? I watch everything. I watch, I, I observe, I am looking for, what am I looking for is, um, is something that I can recognize as authentic behavior. Something that, as specific as it may be to the particular plot or story, is it something that I know to be true to human existence. Um, even if I'm watching, I, when I, I did a, I did a study of um, science fiction films, of, of, of robots in science fiction films. And one of the things that I discovered is that all science fiction films that have some kind of non-human in it is that is their lack of or their desire to be human. And sort of what was the interesting comparison is that the robots which had the external manifestations of a human had no soul. And the ones that, had, that, looked, that didn't look human had the most human features. And you know, I just found that was really, that was really interesting in terms, of, in terms of what draws us to the cinema. So certainly looking for that thing that I know to be true about the human condition is certainly what I look for. The other thing is, is that I know I'm watching a really good movie if I don't see the technique. Is that I am drawn into the story. The story is everything. I am at the, I am at the mercy of the story, both as a filmmaker 
and as a viewer. And the moment that I am living with the characters up on the screen, I know I'm watching a good movie that may even technically be a piece of crap. <laughs> Could you give us an example? Oh. There's so many movies that I so completely adore and love. Um, boy, that is such a... That are technically crap? Um, hmm. Some of the but a, good but a good story. Oh gosh, I'm going to have to think about that one. Let's let's move on. I'll I'll think. I'll think while we talk. Okay. Do you have yeah, a question? Uh, uh, I I have the mic. Okay, go ahead. Does he have a mic too? Can I? No, you do have it. All right. Yes, thank it's you. It's not on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Uh, I I feel very enlightened. There. Can you hear me now clearly? Yeah. Uh, uh, about your uh, turtle analogy. Uh, and then the, I just love that, and uh, and I, I feel it was an amazing experience. If yeah. it, 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 being, if you have the opportunity, please do it. Please and, do and, it. And my, and my question is: the lady who spoke uh, the last, and she Rochelle, and uh, she said she wanted to have a house in Goa with two extra rooms. So, uh, and you talked about uh, deficit, uh, and with uh, you know uh, the, the the turtle analogy, that context in mind. So maybe people like you who've been to Iowa and back and could start off things something like that. Uh, so that deficit uh, couldn't. A very small way be then it's a very good idea I'm thinking about it a lot you know especially after the turtle analogy you know so start off our own residencies you know yeah you know so just a thought and a question yeah 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 I've created a surplus we are uh, 1.120 crores you know so a lot of people in this country that's it thank you thank you yeah yeah turn it on um, this is more of a question for Rochelle a question for Rochelle? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, you know, uh, our English has a lot of masala in it. So when you go to a place where there are so many international international students and, yeah, I can hear the echo. Uh, lots of international students and, you know, um, local teachers. And uh, when you're reading out your stuff to everyone, how is it, uh, I mean, do you feel like you're attenuating the, the masala or the, you know, the Indian English a little bit and is that something you, you would regret over there or maybe not regret, maybe just find that a, a hassle to express yourself correctly? Yeah, um, that's a good question and it's like I uh, uh, announced in Iowa itself that I'm writing in Indian English. And just to make it a little more specific, I said I'm writing in Pawali English. <laughs> so that it, I mean, that's the disclaimers enough. And then, uh, then we moved on with story and we left the language behind. So I think it's, it's good to have, uh, you know, whatever the masala you say, it comes in language, but as long as it comes authentically, organically, we, we are entitled to our masalas. Can I jump in about my movie for just one second? <laughs> it's because I'm thinking about it. And here's the thing, is I can think of great, the great movies I love, but I can't think of any that is technically bad because I don't notice the badness. I just, so I can't, I, I'm going through my mind. Um, one movie that I've seen very recently that I thought was so great um, was The Martian. With, I mean, I was on Mars with that man. You know, I was helping him. I, I, it, and all of, it, you know, this is a movie that is filled with special effects, that is technically brilliant. But it, all, it, it didn't matter. What mattered to me was the moment that he got that plant to grow. And the, you know, and the, the, the ingenious of his mind with the way that things, uh, that he was able to survive. But I can't think of a technically bad movie because I don't notice it. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I loved what you said about authenticity in film and the lack of apparent technique. Uh, I've studied screenwriting in Seattle. They taught me a lot about structure, arcs, act one, act two, act three. It's a lot of technique, full of technique. Somewhere in my process, I'm missing uh, the block I run into is with the authenticity, the soul, the emotional tone of the material. 
And I guess my question to you is, can you talk about the process that you adopt for screenwriting? It's a big question, I know, but maybe at a top level you can talk about that. One of the things I was speaking about this morning in a workshop that we were doing is that unlike my colleagues, what I do is not literature. What I do in terms of making a movie is much more architecture. And it's really about establishing a foundation. Um, a, a, a screenplay is a blueprint for the movie that you want to make for the building that you want to make. It has to have a solid foundation. If it, and that foundation begins, first of all, by knowing what materials you have to work with, knowing what you know about the world and why it's important. That's all foundation. And the most important piece of that foundation is knowing what your movie is about, not what the plot is not you know and there's and it's all you know there's so much that what you're talking about the act one the act two the act three structure is really is really all plot based you put this here you put that there blah 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 and that is not what your movie is about um, there's a there's a there was a wonderful article um, how many of you have seen the movie Forrest Gump okay <laughs> was not one of my favorite movies until I read this article. Um, Forrest Gump is a movie that very famously states what it is about. And it states it about three times in the movie. It says, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And, you know, and for me, it was sort of like, when I first watched the movie, I thought, well, you know, this is a movie where I notice the special effects. This is, a, you know, of Forrest Gump being put into all these positions. This is a movie that I thought was, in some ways, the celebration of somebody who was very stupid. And so I didn't have a lot of respect for it. Then I read an interview, and I, you know, and I realized that the reason I didn't like it came from me and not from the movie itself, because I did not really understand what it was about. And so I read this article where the interviewer was talking to Robert Zemeckis, the director, and wanting to talk about what were at the time the state of the arts um, effects, special effects, putting Forrest Gump in a situation where he's shaking hands with President Kennedy, things like that. And Robert Zemeckis got very agitated and said, if you think this is a movie about special effects, I have completely failed. And the interviewer was taken aback and said, what, what is it about? He goes, this is a movie about grieving. And I was so struck by that, I thought, what? This is a, this is, this is, this is a comedy about somebody who's not really smart. And then I went back and I looked at the movie again. Every moment, every frame in that movie is about grief, one's dealing with griefs, grief, one's reaction to grief, and you start thinking about it, Forrest is a man who loses his best friend. Forrest is a man who loses his girlfriend. He gets his girlfriend back and then loses her again. He almost loses his son. He loses his mother. And it's about how one deals or doesn't deal, and everything that happens to him is a result of the grief that he's experiencing. And it completely changed the movie for me, and it gave me a, much more of a respect for the way to make a really good movie about life is like a box of chocolates, you don't know what you're going to get, is to make it about grief because that is what life does hand you, you know, in terms of sorting, th and, and how does one sort through it and pick the chocolates that they, that they can deal with. I don't know if that helps, but I think you need, the first thing you need to know is what is your movie about? And it's not always what the, and it's never what the plot is. Oh, I'm sorry. Answering question. No, 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 no. Uh, what is the exact like? Um, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, in terms of cinematography and filmmaking, like if I'm doing cinematography, how is it different from filmmaking? How is cinematography different from filmmaking? Yes. 
It's not. It's, it's one aspect of filmmaking. But you, you are literally the translator from the written page to the visual language. And so, like a, tr like a translator of a language, you cannot do a literal translation from what is written on the page to what you see on the screen. What you have to figure out is how do I capture the essence of what is being said. A really good poem, uh, taking t the Odyssey, if you take the Odyssey and translate it into English, exactly how, word for word, how it is written from Greek, you're going to come up with a mess. If you are able to make that translation into a visual language, which we all understand, we may not be able to speak it, but we understand it, and it transcends culture, which more more than almost any other language, really, it unites us as opposed as opposed to dividing us. But finding that universal truth from the written page to the screen is a lifelong journey that when it happens, when you get it right, is so rewarding. So there's, there's not much of a difference in my, in my book. You are one of the major collaborators in the filmmaking process. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, this is Vivek. Yeah. You're right in front of the camera. Oh yeah, I know, I was just forward. <laughs> <laughs> like Gotta yeah. get my side in, you know. Okay, so this question is actually for all three of you, or either or, or one of you. Uh, and it relates to the concept of incubation, yeah, incubators of cre creativity. Uh, I'm an inspiring writer for quite a while now, not yet started off, uh, but I've realized that uh, when the intention is to write, I move away from other books. I move away from uh, experiencing other writers. Yeah? Uh, it somewhere dilutes my process of thinking. So the inspiration is after having read a lot, yeah? but when I want to write my stuff, I want to move away from the other stuff which is written. Is this somewhere that you resonate with? Is this something which happens? Because when you're talking about residencies, you're talking about being in touch with other writers, being in touch with other people, other styles, other forms of art. Like you, I move away, but I move away actually from other people. And I move more deeply into the books. It becomes a very intimate conversation. Um, I was thinking about two things. One, when you were talking about the fact that the image is the one thing that is, it's translatable. And I've been teaching an, an, an image workshop, and well, but it, uh, the day before it was an image workshop saying, this is the one thing that you have that is timeless and is universal. So I, we had that, that correspondence. But uh, one of the other things I've been saying in these workshops is I have been encouraging the students to imitate what they've seen on the page. And there becomes this problem where we feel as though we have to do, um, we have to be unique. And I know the first time I taught imitation, um, this, one of the students was from Israel and she, she just resisted this. And then we were at AWP together and this was right near the end of Seamus Haney's life. And so I had that privilege of, of, of seeing him on, on, on the stage, Nobel laureate, uh, in conversation with Derek Walcott, being interviewed uh, uh, by Rosanna Warren. So we have a Caribbean uh, Nobel Prize winning poet and an Irish Nobel Prize winning poet. And she asked them uh, if they were influenced by Lowell. And they said yes, but they were influenced by many, many other people. And uh, Derek Walcott then said, he quoted Pushkin to paraphrase him, you know, why, why, why even start with something original? You know, I borrow from everyone. He said, in my case, I come from an archipelago. There are many seeds, and we know that about Derek Walcott. Um, people have a good time sort of sourcing those different seeds that, that, that he borrows. And so that doesn't bother me at all. Sometimes, if I'm stuck in a poem, I'll, I'll really read voraciously because someone else will show me 
how to solve that problem. And writers, and I would imagine all artists, we're in this, and a good part of our passion is solving problems. We're, pro we're meaning-making animals and we're problem-solving animals. And I was talking to a wonderful poet, Frank Gaspar, who's turned novelist, and I said, I know why you became a novelist. And he said, why? I said, because it was the hardest thing you could do. You know, you've become a really good poet. Now he's going to become a novelist. Um, because he, those, and he's reading, reading, reading voraciously to learn how to make certain turns. So I actually find that reading, I read more when I'm in the middle of creating. It's very much call and response. Uh, one the, last question. This will be the last question. Um, uh, can you hear me? So, um, writing residencies, they really solve the problem of external noise. But, uh, you know, there is a, so I personally find it really difficult to habituate myself to writing. And uh, I feel that there are these moments where I have, where I can write really clearly and then suddenly, uh, so I'll have like a week and I can write, 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 and then suddenly I won't, I'll just, I'll have a really big block. And I don't know how to make writing a habit. How do I make it a discipline so that I'm writing continuously? How do I make sure that even if it's, so that's one thing. The first thing is that I, I feel very demotivated when I, when I have that block and I feel like I'm a really terrible writer. That's one thing. The second thing is how do I make sure that anyway I just continue to write because that's a struggle. I mean, it's an internal struggle. So how do I deal with that? I have a book that you can, there's a book online you can download. And it's by Dorothea Brand called Becoming a Writer. And I recommend it to all of you who are having that problem. It's a little dated in its language. It was probably written in the 1940s. And trust me, I'm, I'm not really given to self-help books <laughs> at all. But a really interesting writer, Laura Kaczynski, who's won all kinds of awards, and she's both a novelist and a poet, had it on her, she was teaching a workshop, and she had it on her list of, of books to read. And I thought, why is Laura reading this book? And I picked it up, and it kind of reminded me of a Dale Carnegie book in tone a little bit. Um, but it had an introduction by, by John Gardner. And he said, the writer's they, they go to writing workshops and they want to talk about craft and so forth, but the writer's main problem is psychological. And that's what you have to deal with. So what Brand does, and it again, it's got that 1940s feel to it. She does this thing where, do you remember when uh, the Russians used to bend forks with their minds and so forth? Okay, it's got a little bit of that feel. So you create a pendulum and you make the pendulum swing to the right and you make the pendul pendulum swing to the left. And I thought, OK, I'm going to try this, because I'm an empiricist, and I've got a lot of doubt about this book. And I tried it, and it worked. I said, OK, I'll keep reading. Her basic idea is very much the same as William Stafford. And William Stafford was a Northwest poet who was a master of this kind of, 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 of the problem. He said, got a writer's block? Lower your standards. <laughs> And, you know, we don't do that to ourselves. And that's why we install a really big sensor to sit on our shoulder. And we give that sensor permission to shame us over and over again. So you lower your standards. What, what Stafford did was he would get up in the morning and he would make the same time every day. And he wanted to do it, let's say he got up at seven o'clock at first. But his daughter got up with him and she kept getting up. Every He would make it six, five, four. When he got to three in the morning, she stayed in bed. And that became his hour to write. Now that could cause probably psychosis in some people, it's sleep disturbance. But to find that time. And that's what Brand, and this is what Brand says. So you start out, and for two weeks, you write. You just go to the page, and you just write. No censor. You don't even really read what you write. And then after that, you pick another time. Let's say uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And let's say you're at your job, and somebody's talking to you. You make an excuse and go to the bathroom, and you write then. 
Well, I didn't have to do that part, but what I found is it worked, and it worked beautifully, and every time that I, I'm pulled away from writing for a block of time, basically what happens is my, my ability to associate and make poems disappears. I go back to that Dorothea Brand exercise and back to the page, and what it does is it loads it into the body. And I remember, I knew it worked because I dropped my husband off at the airport one day, and I just couldn't wait for him to get out of the car so right there in the airport I could start writing madly because the body wanted to write. <laughs> so so you tra training the body to write and picking the same time to write and guarding that time against everything, I think those are really important things. Can I squeeze in one question? Are you yeah. politely waiting for the mic? I really think that you should <laughs> consider informally approaching the speakers oh. afterwards, yeah? But did you want to come in on Well, this? I did, I did want to say that I, I, first of all, completely agree with everything that uh, Sandra has said about uh, the discipline of, of writing, but I think that you have to come to it with the mindset that writing is difficult. Writing is really, really hard work. And once you accept the fact, you, you expect it to be easy. Because it's like, it's like everybody thinks they can sing. Well, not if you're singing an opera. <laughs> you know, you, you, have to, you have to put a lot of time and training and, and expect there to be a lot of blocks. And so accept the fact that it is very difficult and really accepting it will make it easier that there will knowing that there will be blocks knowing that there will be times when you don't feel like it i mean i have to tell you for myself the best thing that i ever did was i bought an hourglass <laughs> and i would say to myself okay i'm only going to write until the sand is through the hourglass and having that visual, again, being a visual person, right? Having that visual image of watching the sand go through the hourglass as I'm typing away, I would like turn it back over, just like, I just need a little more time, <laughs> you know? And then I would find myself sort of competing against the hourglass and it, it took the sting of doing it away where I would actually look forward to how much can I actually write in that limited hour of time that I have. But, and Sandra and I have talked about this as well, is that, is that it's amazing how clean our house gets when we actually have, before we actually have to sit down and write. I mean, I have the most pristine, beautiful toilet bowl you have ever seen when I'm on deadline. <laughs> but the sands trickled out of our particular hourglass right now. Uh, but it's always wonderful when there's a surplus of questions. So I'm really sorry to have had to cut you off, but I do hope you can get to speak to the two Sandras afterwards. I just want to thank you both for having been so generous with your insights, with speaking from practice, and uh, also really for the eloquence with which you phrased those insights. So thank you both very much indeed, and thank you all for being a wonderful thank audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk, and thank you, Rochelle, for being here with us. Um, thank you to the U.S. Consulate as well for helping making this happen, and thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you.